So uh, there are a hundred of you uh, just sitting here watching me type as I set up my laptop for this lecture. Is there anything worse than watching somebody stare at their computer? I mean, it's not much different than when often these days you go to a concert and watch somebody mix at their laptop, which is as exciting as watching somebody check their email, which can be pretty exciting, except they're not checking their email, they're staring at their laptop, and all you can see is the screen's glow on their face. But think of how much better it would be if that performer were actually checking their email while the music was streaming, and you could watch the whole thing on a screen projected behind them, how intimate and embarrassing and revealing it could be. I remember when laptops uh, were first introduced as the only instrument on the stage in the concert hall. It's around 1995, and I went to see a classical electronic music composer at a proper concert hall on Manhattan's Upper West Side, and I swear, for nearly two hours, we stared at him, staring at his laptop. Perhaps the sounds were great, mm, I don't remember, but I do recall thinking that there was no need to have a human on stage for this music. He was nothing great to look at either, a balding, middle-aged, overweight guy dressed in a tacky Hawaiian shirt. And that's why it's important to realize that when you get up in front of people, you are always performing. You need to be in costume, completely self-conscious and hyper-aware of your presence. Uh, there, there's, a, um, there's a feeling that one's on-stage presence should be uh, truly authentic. And of course, it's anything but. I mean, it's an act, right? Okay, if I was being authentic right now, uh, you'd see me bitching at my kids or paying my electric bill and you certainly didn't come here to see that. You came here to see me do my act. Yes, poets do have acts, which is in some ways authentic and in other ways completely artificial. You are seeing me giving an ideal lecture by my ideal self. I wish I could always be like this. You see, rock musicians are really good at this, you know? You, you watch some videos of, say, uh, Led Zeppelin or the Rolling Stones from the early 70s, and you'll see what I mean. They're so authentically inauthentic that they spawned legions of fans who imitated the authenticity of their style, resulting in an astonishingly convincing inauthentic authenticity. And later on, even when it goes unauthentically authentic, it shifts, becoming newly authentically inauthentic. So I'm thinking of, say, Nirvana, you know, and their grunge style, which reclaimed the dregs of Led Zeppelin's artifice and turned it inside out, making it insincerely authentic. But the grunge fans, they didn't find any insincerity in it by deglamming they reclaimed authenticity. It's terribly complicated. But most poets somehow don't bother with these types of gymnastics. They feel the need to present uh, an unchecked, real, or authentic self. So they get up in front of people in a stained t-shirt and ill-fitting jeans and bad shoes and uh, mumble through their poems. And perhaps you might think that they were being, you know, like Nirvana grunge devotees, or maybe anti-performative, but what they're really doing is being lazy. They're neither authentic nor artificial. They're just flat and unconsidered. And that's why I feel if it's not pretentious or self-conscious, I don't trust it. But anyway, getting back to my sitting here, typing in front of you, uh, it reminds me of my book, Soliloquy, uh, which consisted of every word I spoke for a week in 1997, from the moment I woke up on a Monday morning until the moment I went to sleep on the following Sunday night. 
I transcribed the book completely unedited. I took nothing out. It ended up being about four or 500 pages long, and I said almost nothing of value. It really was an exercise in humiliation. So the way I did it was just with a little micro cassette recorder tucked into my pocket that was connected to uh, a voice-activated microphone, which I wore hidden in my shirt, and when I spoke, it recorded. So around the same time, I had this related idea. I wanted to um, connect my computer to a screen in Times Square uh, so that everything I typed or did uh, on my computer for an entire year would be publicly uh, displayed. Emails I wrote, online banking statements I viewed, porn I watched, every time I self-Googled, but of course, you know, I mean, Google wasn't around then, but you know what I mean, manuscripts that I was working on and so forth. And that would have been the most intimate, revealing, humiliating, and risque thing I could have done, but, you know, it never worked out. Uh, I don't think it was technically possible at that time. And beyond that, no one in Times Square uh, had any interest in some young, unknown poet live streaming their life on the crossroads of the world. Now, looking back on it, I was inspired by Felix Gonzalez Torres's public art piece from around 1990 which was nothing but uh, a static black and white billboard sized photograph of a bed that had just been slept in by two people, reputedly Gonzalez Torres and his lover Ross, both of whom later died of AIDS. And you could see literally the imprints of their heads on the pillows. And the idea was to bring the most intimate space, the bedroom, into the most public space the street. And there are some great documentary photographs of that piece. Uh, one that sticks in my mind is what appears to be this uh, crowded on-ramp to a bridge in the middle of rush hour, and cars are stalled, and the smog is dense, and there is this billboard of this just-slept-in-bed presiding over the whole affair. It's a better version of one of those um, billboards that you see on crowded highways that say, if you lived here, you'd be home by now. So 20 years passed, and in 2016, I decided to do soliloquy again for its 20th anniversary. I mean, what would my regular speech look like 20 years down the line? So much has changed in my life that the transcription would make for completely new type of book. So I tried, and I failed. First of all, the technology still had not arrived and still is not available, where you can just speak and everything that you say can be automatically turned into text and posted on the web in real time, which was my dream back in the 1990s. But even today, when I speak to my phone, it kind of gets it right, but it mostly gets it wrong. And because of the sensitive touch screen, it clicked off, and much of what I actually uh, said wasn't recorded. Finally, about five days into it, I realized that I had accidentally deleted all but one day. And the one day that was left was Tuesday, the day I see my therapist. And I secretly taped my therapy session. And listening back to that day, the most interesting part was that one hour. So after the project failed, I decided I would go into my therapy session every Tuesday afternoon, secretly tape it, and transcribe exactly what I said as a new project. I did that for about eight weeks, after which I thought it would be a really good part of my therapy to tell my therapist what I had been doing. <laughs> and as expected, he freaked out <laughs> and accused me of treason, of exploiting an intimate and ephemeral space, all for an artwork 
But I responded, that is exactly what I do with my artwork. To which he replied, yes, that is exactly your problem. <laughs> Writing on a mobile device is in some ways more and in some ways uh, uh, less work than traditional transcription. So I can't stand typing on my mobile device because my fingers are too big and they're too clumsy. But it's, again, it's not much better when I speak to it, when I speak voice recognition, because then I've got to go back in and I've got to correct it. And beyond that, even if I'm speaking voice to text, I have to say the word period when I want to end a sentence and the word comma when I want to put in a pause and new paragraph when I want, when I want a line break. And sometimes the phone understands comma and period and question mark, but just as often it doesn't. So if I'm asking a question like, what time do you want to have lunch today, question mark, I actually get a sentence back that says, what time do you want to have lunch today, question mark. And then I feel stupid when I've got to go back in and make the words question mark into an actual question mark to which my son, who is 11, says to me, but dad, why do you use question marks when you type texts? Which is a good question. I find it very strange when people on social media post questions as statements without question marks. And you know it's a question, but it appears to be a statement, which is the whole thing is completely disconcerting. In the future, people will simply stop using punctuation altogether. Now, punctuation, of course, was one of the first things to be attacked by the modernists. John Cage, who was an anarchist, saw syntax as the government of language, with punctuation marks acting as the policemen. Adorno claimed that all sorts of authoritarian structures like traffic signals were modeled on punctuation. Uh, Adorno felt exclamation points to be red lights, colons were green lights, and he thought that dashes uh, were yellow. And Gertrude Stein felt that possessive apostrophes were, well, too possessive, strangling the letters that they were attached to. But the most extreme punctuation I ever encountered, and this is amazing, uh, was by this American ultra-modernist writer. His name, I, I can't remember, it escapes me now. But this guy in the 1920s wrote an entire novel where he inserted exclamation points in between each and every letter. And I remember it was impossible to read this book. Now, I suspect if you removed all the exclamation points, you'd find a, you know, a story, a conventional narrative. But of course, nobody was going to do that. Now, I have no idea what this guy was trying to do, but I like to fantasize. I mean, wouldn't it have been great if he took, um, I don't know, say a boring novel by a boring writer? and simply inserted exclamation points in between each and every letter and then just published it under his own name? I mean, that is such a great idea. Somebody should actually uh, do that with, say, a Jonathan Franzen novel, right? And that would make uh, the Franzen so much more exciting, and it would also make it so much more boring. And it reminds me of this uh, piece by a composer I once knew who took a really thorny, atonal Schoenberg composition. And he, all he did was he erased the notation for sharps and flats. And then he signed his own name to it. And when he played it back, it sounded exactly like New Age music, really tonal and sort of stupidly melodic. And with this one simple gesture, he completely defanged Schoenberg. So I think the guy that wrote the exclamation point book wanted to make people aware that language is material, that words have physical qualities, as well as semantic ones, something that you know, we tend to forget about in day-to-day -day life. I'm mostly speaking transparently the way I am to you right now. But the guy might have also been listening to the sound of technology 
And I'm thinking maybe he was listening to the noise of telegrams, and he was trying to track it onto literature. And in those days, when you wrote a telegram, all punctuation marks cost extra money, except for stop, S-T-O-P, which for some reason was free. So telegrams became unpunctuated except for stop, which became a catch-all punctuation mark. It became a comma, a colon, a semicolon, a dash, an M dash, a question mark, and a period all in one. It might have even been an exclamation point as well. And people just wanted to save money, and they had no problem bending language in order to do that. So maybe the guy who wrote the exclamation point book was saying, uh, fuck you to the telegram, and fuck you to the cost of punctuation. Remember, back then, words cost a lot of money to print. Inadvertently, though, he triggered this other expensive situation. At a time when many books were still hand set with lead type, I'm sure that the shop that was setting the, ex the, the book didn't have enough exclamation points to insert between each and every letter. Um, if you took, say, Ernest Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms and inserted exclamation points in between each and every letter, you'd need 494,177 exclamation points. And of course, nobody had that many exclamation points. And I'm thinking, what did they do? Did they buy more? I mean, that would have been a shitload of money. And then, what would they do with all those exclamation points after they had finished typesetting the book? I mean, I imagine they'd be hard to sell en masse. Uh, who needs nearly half a million lead exclamation points? And maybe they sold them as scrap metal. You know, maybe they just melted them down and made new letters from them, the ones that everyone wanted, instead of a bunch of exclamation points that no one wanted. Which reminds me of a few years ago in the United States when gas prices hit the $5 a gallon mark and they didn't have enough fives for their plastic price displays. So instead, they started using S's, which they had plenty of. And when things got really desperate, they turned twos upside down and they used them. And it always strikes me strange that uh, still today, in most American gas stations, they have plastic letters for prices, not LED screens where all letters and numbers are in perpetual supply. I mean, nobody ever runs out of LED letters. Which reminds me of when ISIS destroyed the ancient city of Palmyra. And while the world watched in horror, one local guy, when asked about the devastation, he just shrugged. And he said, these stones have been knocked down so many times before, we'll just put them back together like they always have been. And it reminds me then of letters and words. All the words that we use are used, ancient, worn, stacked, demolished, and reassembled in both very new and very old ways. There's no need to create more words, a giant, freely, circulating stockpile exists, so we don't have to worry about either paying outrageous prices for them or running out of words anytime soon. Today we have an endless supply of letters and numbers. We're drowning in language, which can start to feel like an embarrassment of riches. Sometimes, I gotta admit, I feel guilty about how much language I consume. So guilty that I actually sometimes reuse notes in my notes pad on my iPhone instead of making new ones. I'll just erase everything that's on my current note and write new text into it. Not because it's easy, it takes a lot more work to delete old text. It would just be so much easier uh, tossing it out and cracking a new one, but because it feels uh, more what? ecological, 
let's say. And this is hardwired into me. Uh, I was a kid uh, during the energy crisis of the 1970s where we were not permitted to leave a, a room with the light still on. To this day, I'm going to share something intimate with you. To this day, when I brush my teeth, I turn the water on and off between rinses. I know it's crazy, but it somehow relates back to my need to cherish resources rather than to waste them, which is one of the reasons I prefer to use other people's words rather than my own when I'm writing. I'd rather recycle them. <clears throat> I use appropriation. Appropriation feels more ecologically sound than having to invent your own words each time. And then when you're done, you can toss them back into the recycle bin so somebody else can use them once again. And like the exclamation guy, the exclamation point guy, I should say, who was listening to telegrams, I'm listening to the connections between the modernist and the digital, between Twitter and the telegram. And so, while the average bro or president <laughs> trolling around on Twitter probably knows nor cares very little about modernism, he's unconsciously hardwired to it. And now it's funny to think about it, but just think of the way that URLs or hashtags look like all those compound words in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. So reading has always been a sort of parsing, but hashtags take it to a new level. Reading hashtags is a two-step process. Because they have no spaces, you have to first mentally add them before you read them. So when we see a hashtag, the first thing we do is we parse it. We break down this unfathomable-looking beast of a word into its constituent parts until it becomes legible, which is exactly the way that Joyce challenged us to read Finnegan's Wake. We've learned to read long hashtags so well at this point that we don't even bother to capitalize the words in them anymore the way we once did. Now, the small letters, like James Joyce, just run into one another. And it is so strange to think that on the internet, in the 21st century, we're reading the way that James Joyce predicted we would read 80 years ago. And while URLs and hashtags are airless, the web itself is full of gaps, riddled with holes. We like to think that the web is instantaneous, and in some cases, such as fiber optics, I'm told it is. But for most of us, it's really not. Think of the interval between the time you dial someone on your phone and the time it takes to start ringing, or the interval between sending a text and getting a response, or the interval between clicking on a link and when your web page actually loads, or the interval it takes for a video to buffer, there's even an ecology of interval signs, the loading symbol that looks like a white clock dial that ticks away in a circle, or that spinning, colorful beach ball of death when your browser is hung, or that little wristwatch with its hands ticking away the time. But my very favorite are those three bouncing dots that you see when, someone is, when you text somebody and they're typing back at you. I mean, it's really creepy, these three bouncing dots. You're actually feeling another person's presence. And you hang in that interval, trying to anticipate what's coming at you, already forming your own response to a text that you haven't even read yet. It's super anticipatory and very 19th century. We've all become mind readers soothsayers and psychics, the web has become a giant electronic Ouija board. Who knew that in the 21st century, the occult 
would be back. But the web is just a mirror of what happens in real life. I mean, look, look at what's happening here. I'm, I'm feeling bad about speaking English to 100 people for whom English is not their first language. I'm really self-conscious of this. So I'm trying my hardest to speak simply, slowly, and clearly so that you'll be able to understand what I'm saying. But still, I'm not entirely sure you're understanding me. I mean, there's, there's no way of knowing. You appear to be understanding what I'm saying. You're nodding your heads and you're chuckling at my bad jokes. So I think you're getting some of it, but I'm not sure you're getting all of it, at least in the way that I intend it. But then again, even when I'm talking to other native English speakers, I sense that they're not getting all of it exactly the way I intend it either. In English, I constantly get um, embroiled in all sorts of fuck-ups, miscommunications, misunderstandings. I mean, you would think that the people I love most in the world, my family and my friends, would understand me. In some ways, they do, but in most ways, they don't. And sometimes, they're the ones that have the most trouble understanding me, and yet they speak the same language that I do. And if we don't understand each other, my friends and my family, how can I expect a room full of strangers for whom English is not their first language to understand me as I intend it? In fact, understanding exactly as I intend it never happens. I think we're better on the web in that anticipatory interval. But in real life, we s still seem to be saddled with misunderstanding. But is there a way of seeing this as being something good? Can we see this moment, a poetry reading, as a way of embracing our mutual misunderstanding? After all, hasn't misunderstanding or ambiguity been the hinge upon which art has swung? In art, there's no consensus, there's just interpretation, a conversation that takes place with disagreement, conflict, and misunderstanding as its basis, one in which we agree to disagree. Can we extend that lesson into our lives, like at this moment? Could our lack of understanding be a demonstration of the power of poetry. Instead of trying to solve it, can we learn to accept it and even embrace it? Then misunderstanding ceases to be a problem and begins to be an opportunity. This is what I've been trying to do with my work for so many years, to misunderstand the language in which it's written in, which is English. For years, I would begin my readings in non-English speaking countries with a pre-prepared statement that had been translated into the language of the country in which I was reading. It would start like this. Je suis une artiste création art à partir des mots comme la plupart d'Américains et je ne parle qu'une langue quand à m'en demander de, uh, de lire à Paris, je décide que la dernière chose dont les France et le reste du monde avaient besoin, c'est davantage de culture américaine importée en anglais, bien sûr. Vous vous rappelez de I'm so bored with the USA, de The Clash. Par conséquent, je choisis de commencer mon discours en français, en langue que je n'ai jamais parlé ni lu. And then I would continue to read this <laughs> longish statement in the worst French or Spanish or Finnish, try Finnish, <laughs> that anyone's ever heard, so that even the native speakers of that language couldn't understand what was supposedly in their own language. 
And I would finish this, the talk, still uh, in, in their own language, with je pourrais continuer en français, mais je crois avoir ressenti mon point. Je présentais le reste de mon discours en anglais, mais après ces débuts, quelques, quelques peu rudes, vous comprenez mieux ce que j'essaie de complaire par le bias de ma langue maternelle, l'approximation du contexte utopique que nous vivons actuellement, celui de mes connaissances volontaires. You understood. Sometimes when I do a talk in a non-English speaking country, they hire a translator for simultaneous translation, which adds to reduce the noise and mitigate the ambiguity. But in reality, translation inadvertently adds another sort of noise, the noise of approximation, which is another form of misunderstanding. And no matter how hard we try, we can't win. Yet here we are, pretending that nothing is wrong, but nothing is wrong. I feel like I'm not speaking English. Or I feel like I'm speaking someone else's English, which in many ways I am, because when you appropriate someone else's words, as I often do in my writing, you intentionally misunderstand them. So for this one early book I did, I appropriated an entire short story by D.H. Lawrence that was called The Rocking Horse Winner. And I published it as the last chapter of my book, only because the last syllable of the last word of that story fit in with my conceptual scheme. And to this day, I still haven't read the story, and I have no plan to. And I took D.H. Lawrence's story, and I did something with it he hadn't intended. And it worked, at least for me it did. And in this way, his story became my story. Could we see appropriation as literary communism? an acknowledgement that no one owns words, that they're a shared resource. When I copy other people's words, I write in English as if it's foreign to me, with ideas that I don't invent and sentiments that I don't share. I write things that I often disagree with. I write things that disgust me. It's really liberating. Because no matter what you do with words, whether you write them or find them or steal them, they always mean something. And depending on what you do with them, where you put them, or how you frame them, they have different meanings. I think uh, as writers, we try too hard to make meaning when the material that we're using is saturated with meaning. No matter how much we hack them up or remix them, even the most abstract uses of language, like phonemes and even single letters, still resonate with profound meaning. Our job as writers is much easier than we think. So Soliloquy had this postscript that went, if every word spoken in New York City daily were somehow to materialize as a snowflake, each day there'd be a blizzard. I mean, I love the idea of language accumulating like snow. And just before I wrote Soliloquy, there was this huge blizzard in New York. Uh, it was one of the worst ever. And when it snows in New York, what they do is they scoop up the snow and they load it onto trucks and they dump it into the river where it dissolves, flowing back into the ocean. And I thought, if speech was materialized as snow, at the end of the day, they would have to do the same thing with all that language. They'd collect it and they'd shovel it into trucks and dump it into the river in order to make it melt away into the ocean and just start again the next day. Which reminds me of a story of Rabelais, and it was a story he told about a battlefield that was so cold that on the day of the battle, even the sounds of the battle froze and fell to the ground. And there they lay all winter long until spring when the frozen sounds 
began to melt. And as they melted, the sounds were replayed, not in the order in which they were originally made, but the order in which they melted. It was a cacophony. But certain people on this battlefield picked up these sounds before they melted, and they brought them into an ice cellar where they remained frozen for centuries. And when they finally thawed, sounds were heard from six or seven hundred years ago. Which reminds me of this very dear friend of mine who's a very successful painter and a, uh, a very wealthy man. And when you make that kind of money, you trade paintings for wine. But the problem is that he loves wine but his wife doesn't drink. So his greatest joy is to invite his friends over to his house where he just starts taking out these incredible bottles that are worth hundreds of dollars simply because he's just dying to share his wine with someone. It really is just the most amazing thing. It's great going over to this guy's house. And I remember him taking out a bottle of port from the early 1800s. And it wasn't the best port I ever drank, but the idea that I was drinking a liquid from over 200 years ago was completely incredible. And I find all of these things fluid, rife with history. I find the materiality of liquid or the materiality of sound or the materiality of language to be interchangeable with words taking so many forms. And maybe this is why I love digital language so much. I love the way that the digital has liquidated language. You know, I've often thought of the metaphor of the water cycle that describes the ways in which language moves from the, throughout the digital ecosystem, from frozen solid artifacts like movies, right, to flowing liquid states like torrents that are always floating around. And sometimes they're slushy, partially frozen, partially melted, like when you're simultaneously playing an MP3 while it's seeding a torrent up to the cloud. Even the metaphors that we use to describe the digital ecosystem are atmospheric and weather-inspired. I love the idea that, like urine, we stream our media. Like Dolly's watches, when we play MP3s, they unfurl, they melt, they loosen, they lessen, they deflate, they soften. But no matter how hot my computer gets, it never actually softens, nor does it sweat or wet itself. I sometimes half expect to pick up my laptop after a long session and find a pool of liquid beneath it. And I'm always disappointed to find that it's bone dry. It hates water, and it hates grease and yet its surfaces are slathered with both. Morsels of a croissant drop into the valleys on my keyboard, and they get ground into smaller crumbs each time I punch my keys and write my poems. And specks of saliva fling from my lips and land on my screen, and they dry there waiting until I pick them off with my fingernails. A desiccated sweat from the heels of my hand create these ghost-like washes on other side of my trackpad. Stray eyelashes fall between my arrow keys and are devoured by my machine's innards. And if you hold my Android up to the light in just the right way, you can see my swipe pattern created by the grease from my finger that's been run in the same shape so many times that it might as well have been channeled into stone. And from time to time, I wipe my pattern away. But moments later, it reappears again when I run my finger back over it to unlock my phone. And my device's oleophobic layer sits atop Gorilla Glass. And like my skin, it wears out and dries, it loses its lubrication. Bull, it buckles and crack, brittle with age, and eaten away by the acidity of my sweat, my device is in an eternal state of undress. My finger no longer glides 
It skitters, resisting my touch rather than courting it. And I reach for a tube of grease and a Q-tip, and with a circular motion, I caress its surface. Now newly moistened, my finger glides across its surface like an ice dancer traversing the ice. On hot summer evenings, driblets of sweat plunge from my brow onto my screen and slither over its rounded edges, saturating its ports. Lifting my device, I notice my desk is wet. I wipe it up, and then I wipe my brow. My device and I are one. I paw my keyboard until the letters wear off. Always A's, D's, S's, E's, and T's. Never P's, U's, C's, or V's. And if I can continue pounding my machine at this rate, I won't have any letters left at all, just bare unadorned, naked keys. So desperate, I purchase a skin impregnated with a smoothie silk lubricant for comfort and sensitivity, so thin, they say, that I won't know it's there. And I unbox it using both my hands, and I unfurl it over my keyboard, form-fitting. It's powdery, and it smells like latex. And the next day, I return it to Amazon. And when they ask me why, I tell them that typing feels like having safe sex. Rust never sleeps. Flesh to machine, pixel to paper, and back again. I'll never forget how astonished my grandfather was in the 1970s when he first saw a fax machine. And he received, he, he received this fax from my grandmother who was at the time traveling abroad, and he was stunned. He said, how could someone's handwriting that he knew intimately, he'd even received love letters from this handwriting, dematerialize and get sent over the phone lines and then reappear as an identical facsimile of what used to arrive in the post in the morning or on his pillow at night. You know, people say that technology makes us cold and separates us, but if my grandfather is any example, it's anything but that. His reaction to that primitive fax machine was hyper-emotional. Just think of all the invisible language right now, rife with emotion flowing through this room. Wi-Fi signals, text messages, radio waves, television transmissions. With every breath we take, the air is thick with language. It's a wonder we don't yes, sure. choke on it. There's this great moment in the original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the one with Gene Wilder, where Mike TV gets teleported from one side of the room to the other. And Willy Wonka explains it like this. You photograph something, and the photograph is split up into millions of tiny pieces, and they go whizzing through the air and down to your TV, where they're all put back together again in the right order. If they can do it with a photograph, how come I can't do it with a bar of chocolate? And Mike TV forces his way in front of the camera, and his body disintegrates into millions of pieces, as you just saw, visualized as television static floating through the air, only to rematerialize on the other side. And I was trained as a sculptor, and I learned about the transformative materiality in foundries and ceramic studios where masses of liquids were alchemically transformed into imagistic solids. People sometimes ask me if I, make, if I miss making sculpture, and I tell them that the digital has the same physical qualities as stone. When I'm hammering away on my keyboard all day, I might as well be chipping away at marble or pounding a piano. And when I'm really typing, judging by the flourishes my hands are making, I could be playing a list sonata. And when I code HTML, with a mere keystroke, all that language somehow becomes image exactly as it does when I, when, I, when I post to Facebook. Posting to Facebook is no different than taking a pot out of a kiln. Today, technology and writing are inseparable. But while almost everybody writes on a computer, 
the effects of technology almost never show up in the actual writing itself. You know, word processing uh, programs crash all the time. You're writing mid-sentence and the machine hangs, right? And you force quit the program and then resume as though nothing ever really happened, right? But you know that a lot has happened. And I'm always kind of curious, like, why hiccups like recovered documents or temporary files actually don't make it into books? Why doesn't the bug become the literature? How come you can't buy paperback books at the airport that have glitches in them? I mean, look, think about it. Most of our textual environment is glitch anyway. Wads of spam and mi mi miles of quoted text and infinitely mirrored retweets all born of the refractive platform upon which they are composed and distributed. When we read and write on the network, but in our books, they're nowhere to be found. And it's so different in other fields, like music, where technological errors, you know, obviously are the basis for entire aesthetics. I'm thinking of something like uh, music concrete, where the tapes were stretched and manipulated and warped to create new sounds that nobody ever heard of. And it also actually reminds me of this one um, musician I knew who back in the 1970s actually left her eight-track copy of Led Zeppelin's Zoso on her car's dashboard where it melted on a hot summer day. And knowing it could only be played once, she made a recording of it, capturing a glorious, wobbly version of Black Dog and an elongated, loopy stairway to heaven before the eight-track tape died. She then signed her name to it, claimed it as her own recording, and uh, today, though, nobody would argue with the terms industrial or noise music. Imagine hip-hop without the scratches. Imagine sampled music without the samples. Or auto-tune pop without auto-tuning, and then you have some idea of what literature sounds like today. So why the hesitation in writing? I think it's fear of language itself. After all, unlike an atonal piece of music or an abstract painting, writing is comprised of language in its entirety. The very material we use to communicate with one another. Language is what makes up everything from business proposals to recipes to love letters. And as I said before, we have so much trouble understanding each other in our own and normal language. Why would we want to make it more difficult by purposely adding more noise to it? Language is delicate, and people get really nervous when you fuck with it. And I think that's one of the reasons why all these writers err on the side of caution with words, even in literature. Uh, which is uh, arguably a safer and less loaded linguistic realm than business, law, or love. Interfering with language is breaking a societal taboo. From childhood, everybody learned to write, right? We all learned to write in the same way. There were rules. There were right ways to spell. There were wrong ways to spell. There were proper uses of grammar, and there were improper uses of grammar, and there wasn't a whole a uh, lot of room for leeway. And for most people, it never changed. Language stays strictly functional. But the strange thing is that the web has forced writing and books to change in unexpected ways. So 10 years ago, we heard that uh, the web was going to kill books, right? But that turned out not to be true. I mean, now there are more books than ever. And they're more beautiful than ever. I think people got tired of shitty PDFs. I think people got tired of piles of pixels. So like painting did when the camera arrived, books had to take a turn in order to survive when the web arrived. And so what did they do? 
their move was to become completely gorgeous, the sorts of things that, you know, you really have to have. Uh, you know, any of us who go into a bookstore today and everything is unbelievably designed, printed on thick paper and bound in the most luscious covers. I mean, even poetry books. I mean, for years, poetry books, I mean, they're the ugliest things on the planet because they had to be made cheaply. And their ugliness, the, the, the poetry book's ugliness signified anti-consumerism. It had a certain claim to a truth, a resistance, which rebutted the idea of a glossy culture. But today, even philosophy books have been repackaged to be beautiful. I'm thinking um, of this recent series of the selected works of Walter Benjamin, which are rainbow-colored books with grainy, romantic, black-and-white photos from the Benjamin period. On the covers, images of like stainless steel fans and old-fashioned cameras and wet city streets at night. Now, the content, of course, is the same, but because of the web, the packaging for these Benjamin books are over the top. And the weird thing is that in spite of their good design, Walter Benjamin does not mean anything less than he did when he was bound in ugly covers. Good design did not hurt Walter Benjamin one bit. And you wonder, why didn't this happen long ago? And the answer is because the worst design thing in the whole world, the web, made good design possible. Paradoxically, the web has given us back the artifact. So instead of asking what the web can do, it might be better to ask what it can't do. The web cannot produce a beautiful book. The web cannot produce a thick piece of vinyl. The web cannot produce a locavore meal. The web cannot produce a glazed piece of ceramics. The web cannot produce a soft woven sweater. And the web cannot produce a unique oil painting yet. And this is why painting continues to live. The web kept painting relevant for the exact reason that the web cannot make a painting. And everybody says, oh, the web is destroying this, the web is destroying that. But for all it's destroying, it's also rekindling and reviving uh, an entirely other set of cultural artifacts, making them more valuable precisely because the web can't do them. And just when we were supposed to be liberated from our objects, we're drowning in them, getting swept away by the flow. But the web is flow, and these artifacts are islands in that stream. And there's something sort of zen about living in the flow, right? And there's something also sort of, well, drifty and meaningless about it also. The web is liquid. It flows through our fingers. There's no handles. There's nothing to grab onto. Amnesiac and ludic. The 24-hour cycle renders the traditional markers of time obsolete one day. Flows into the next. Catastrophes, deaths, obituaries, gossip, photos, politics only to be displaced by the next thing barreling down that stream. People often ask me uh, why I still publish books. And I think the reason is to stop the flow. In order to make an argument, you need to freeze that flow, at least for a moment, where you draw upon the past and you speculate upon the future in the one crystallized present, which is a book. And books become markers in that stream, which continue to flow around them. But they feel solid, like totems to which discourse can cling.
The idea that literature could be flow, of course, comes from the Surrealists. And I love their idea of automatic writing. I want all writing to be automatic. I want writing to be as easy as speaking. I want writing to be as easy as doing the dishes. I want writing to be as easy as looking at a web page. I want writing to be as easy as thinking. But the downside of flow is that it's not that interesting. But the best surrealist literature wasn't really flow at all. I mean, those guys went back in, and they fine-tuned everything to produce this very high-end literature. You know, the surrealists cheated in a really lovely way. And I like the idea that you can go back in and make it a little bit better. I mean, you need to adjust the signal-to-noise ratio in order to get decent literature. I mean, so much literature is being produced by bots and algorithms these days. And one of the mistakes that the new automatic writers make is to accept exactly what the machine produces. Now, machines produce too many good ideas. They need to be teased out. Those ideas need to be sorted out. Otherwise, you're just reproducing flow. So, I'm finishing up here, and my last topic will be about flow. Speech is flow, but as a book, soliloquy was a marker in that stream. I wrote that book in the third week of April of 1996. Can anybody in this room remember exactly what they said in the third week of April? of 1996, or the third week of April in 2006, or the third week of April in 2016? And even if you did, I mean, you have no idea exactly what you said, but I remember everything that I did during that week. Of course, I don't remember what happened the week before, and I don't remember what happened the week after, but I remember everything from that one week because of what I said. It was remarkable that through those words, today, I can precisely conjure events and emotions from 20 years ago. I think it was the most meaningful week of my entire life, precisely because I captured what I said. There have been traumatic weeks, and there have been great weeks, yet none of those have any meaning compared with the one week when I captured and wrote down every word I spoke. Which reminds me uh, of a man I met a few years ago in Berlin. We were both at a conference uh, speculating about the future of literature, and he was, this <laughs> he was this university scientist working on building actual automatic writing programs programs that could take a set of statistics and transform them into natural language. So he would take things like the stats of a football game and write a program that churned it into a report for a newspaper so believably written that you couldn't tell that the whole thing had been done by machine. I mean, it was really pretty amazing. And then I spoke about my practice of automated writing automatic writing. And this guy listened, <laughs> and he was completely puzzled. Why in the world would I want to do the opposite of what he was doing? Why in the world would I want to write more like a machine? As a scientist, he was trying to solve a problem. And as an artist, I was trying to create a problem. And to him, that was just unbelievably weird. <laughs>